Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first presentation and webinar from the new committee of the IESLWA chapter. Uh, uh, I'm your host, Tissa Vijay Singha. And uh, let me tell you about a few housekeeping things. Uh, the presentation will go on for about 40, approximately 40 minutes. And you can ask questions after the presentation. However, during the presentation time, if you want to ask questions, please use the chat box. And uh, uh, at the end of the session, or depending on presenters' uh, wishes, I can uh, ask those questions from the presenters. So without much ado, uh, I will call upon Chief Operating Officer of NIHA Associates, uh, Mr. Matisha Jayasekara, to introduce uh, the speakers. NIHA Associates is the organization that uh, kindly uh, kindly agree to make this presentation. Over to, over to you, Matisha. Thank you. Thanks, Anka. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Matisha uh, Sekra. I am the Chief Operating Officer of NIHA. Uh, we're a maintenance and asset management company. Uh, we've taken the ISO 27000 journey, I guess. And uh, today we're here to sort of uh, document that journey with you and hopefully give you some insights into that journey and, and the, I guess, the pitfalls and the complications you see, as well as the success you see from the outside. I'm going to talk only a few minutes about more the business element. Uh, I've got Craig over here on my right. Uh, Craig's the IT manager for our organization, and he looks after all the IT infrastructure with uh, Samira as well, who is also on the call, but he's on a different location due to COVID as we all have to put up with COVID these days and isolations and things like that. Um, so Samir is uh, our cybersecurity expert uh, and as part of that IT team, uh, both together deliver the overall IT framework and the cybersecurity framework. So without further ado, I will give the slide pack to Craig and I'll jump in when required. Okay, thanks, Natisha. Um, so I hope everybody can see the, the slides okay. Um, so, yeah, I'll just... Um, can we confirm that everybody can see the slides? Yep. Yeah, it's visible. Okay, excellent. Okay, um, so, I mean, probably there's not much introduction required for information security per se. Um, I guess the starting point is um, normally in, a, in an open forum would sort of say, you know, who, who has been hacked? That's the, that's the leading question. Um, and, and the fact is, it's essentially everybody. Um, certainly, um, almost everybody I know, or at least one of their services has been hacked at some point. Um, and that's at all levels. Um, and every day on the news, you see another incident um, at, at all levels, um, whether it's sort of local or, um, or sort of a global incident. Um, and be sure there, there's, constant cybersecurity um, events happening every day um, in, in your organization. Um, there'll be at a minor level, um, phishing, spear phishing, so on, um, up against, but if you have any services open to the internet, um, they will be constantly being probed um, for vulnerabilities. Um, so we've got a relatively short amount of time. So we're just um, um, doing a, a pretty much a whirlwind tour, um, but hopefully uh, in spite of that, we'll be able to give you some practical information, um, practical insights that you, um, we we uh, we developed through our, our own journey um so yeah we'll, we'll cover hopefully information security information security management systems um and the iso 27001 certification um actually in reverse order um so we'll start with probably the most useful information first um and i might ask my teacher here to speak about the um i guess the the business um, environment that led to the decision on yep. the certification thanks thanks greg um, I guess when you come down to the question about cybersecurity and any risk or any security threat that you have to a business, 
first of all, you think of the business need. What, why do we need this? Why do we need this certification? For us as a business, um, the, the information we held uh, that was our own uh, IP and all knowledge that we've gathered over operating for you know, 20 odd years, but also the, the security of the data and the information that our clients provide to us meant that we actually hold one of the more critical assets that we own is uh, the data and the information and actually protecting that from, you know, cybersecurity was a big part of it. So, you know, from a commercials point of view, um, there, there's no financial incentive to do this, but from a reputational point of view and actually being, um, you know, more viable to our clients, we, we actually, uh, we've actually seen an uptake of people giving us work purely because we have this certification on board, which is not uh, an expected outcome. This was something we thought from an internal point of view, we wanted to um, protect our information. And I think that the 27,000 certification was really not necessarily a journey we started when we started cybersecurity. We probably started cybersecurity and information security a long time before that. It just culminated in we've got all these systems in place. How can we get a formal um, sort of authorization document that says that we have done what we're supposed to do and we can sort of tell uh, our clients and, and outside um, people that outside our business that we are actually secure and you can actually rely on our uh, information when you give it to us. Um, for us as a, an organization going forward, we will look at digital applications. And for that, this becomes literally a, a, a no-brainer. You must have this in place before you go into a digital application process. I guess that's from a business point of view. It made sense for us to go. Um, we have seen a commercial benefit to it, but that's not always a case. But from an individual risk management point of view, it's actually... Uh, and cybersecurity, I think, from a secondary point of view, I wanted to sort of highlight from a business point of view, it wasn't actually just external, it's actually internal as well. Mm. We've been able to protect internally, you know, risk of an employee getting frustrated and deleting documents or having access to documents they don't need to or vice versa. So it's actually the business need comes both from inside and outside. So, um, I mean, predominantly it's outside, but there, there is a cybersecurity risk internally as well. So for us as a business, it made sense. And uh, sort of the business decided that this was a journey we want to go for. And we put a team together. Um, and I guess Craig were, and Samira were leading that team. So I'll just mm. maybe let you uh, continue the journey. So let's provide some information. I, I, I do, um, one of the questions we get asked about ISO 27001 um, certification of people who have not actually gone through it is simply, you know, nuts and bolts of what, what's involved from a project planning viewpoint. Um, and as, as um, Letitia sort of um, uh, explained, um, our starting point was actually very good. We, we couldn't have asked for a better, um, a, a better point to, to, to start the project. Um, Niha was already um, uh, maturely ISO 9001 certified um, and ISO 27001 along with a few of the other management systems that they're all explicitly designed to, to integrate well with each other. Um, so we could we could literally reuse the existing systems um, and and um, comply with requirements of twenty seven thousand one. Um, as also as as Matisha mentioned, um, we we had very good cyber security. Um, our technical controls are very strong, um, and um, that's almost entirely due to the hard work of, of Samira in, um, in in building a, a very strong um, suite there. Um, and also, um, uh, Nihao's business model is is quite um, quite mature. Um, it's certainly um, dynamic um, and, um, and and expanding, but um, but uh, I have I have worked with organisations where um, every day there's a different uh, business process being introduced. That would be a lot harder um, to actually um, build a well structured management system around. But um, it, it, can, it can be done. But um, it's more that that'd be more a high level. Okay, and in terms of the resources. The financial commitment um, in, in sort of capital outlay was actually quite minimal. Um, we did have to buy a little bit of infrastructure, um, but uh, by and large, our existing uh, equipment was was more than adequate. Um, and information-wise, um, th there's vast amounts of resources available. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll provide some links later. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there, there's a lot, a lot of information. So really, the, the key to it, key to the successful project was was the people. Um, 
And um, Matisha obviously provided executive sponsorship. Um, couldn't ask for a, a better place to sponsor for the for the project. Um, so that that meant we had the the authority to um, to spend our own time uh, to achieve this objective. Um, we 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 were lucky in having two um, IT resources in house. Um, not every company has that luxury, um, but um, but it, yeah, that 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 um, benefited us. Um, we also had um, uh, high quality um, QA resources. Um, that did actually change in the middle of it. Um, Mahesh, um, who I believe is in the IESL, um, it was, was critical at the early stages, but when he um, handed the role on to, to Heiss, um, he, he then carried that on. Um, we actually managed to bring an intern on board. Um, there's a lot of cybersecurity um, undergrads now, um, desperate for experience. Um, and, and she was actually extremely helpful. Um, so yeah, if you can get hold of a resource like that, 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 that can make a difference. Um, and I'll, I'll also uh, mention uh, uh, Dr. Lucknow Rupa Singer, um, uh, who I believe is, is based in Sri Lanka, um, provide a lot of, um, kindly uh, provide a lot of very helpful advice. So thank you to him. Any questions, uh, any questions on that? Okay, there we go. Move on. Um, so I'll just give you a project timeline. Um, really, certainly from an IT viewpoint, it, it was drawn to our attention that we would be moving this direction um, about mid 2020. Um, and uh, just to give it to bracket that, um, we'll we'll receive our certification by May 2021. Um, so the entire uh, length of that project um, was was within that that 12 month period. Um, the project kicked off in September. That's when we um, allocated labour resources to it. Um, Fairly hectic few months. Um, we, we we had our we all had our day jobs. We, we, we had to keep working inside the system as as, as well as um, on the system. Um, we reached um, initial audit in in December. Um, the the outlay for that, if, if you're curious, is about um, five thousand Australian dollars. That's the typical um, certification fee offered by the certifying um, uh, organisations. Um, they provided some feedback. Um, a couple of um, major non-conformances. Um, and um, but but they, they indicated we're in, a, we're in a good place. So in that light, we moved on. We arranged the uh, March 2021 certification audit. Uh, that's a bit more of an involved process. Um, that involved a, a thorough technical review as well as the documentation heavy um, initial audit. Um, that was completed um, within three days. Um, pretty much at that time, we were told we passed the certification. Um, surprisingly, it actually took another two months um, before the actual JAS ends, um, which is the local ISO um, uh, certification representative, actually issued, issued the certificate and we could actually publicly announce it. Um, there's no actions on us, um, but simply it's just a hurry up and wait for those two months, which um, yeah, I think is part of, part of the game. Um, and we'll have to, we're having a surveillance audit scheduled um, 12 months after the initial audit. Um, that's actually next month for us, so we're preparing for that. Um, again, that's a, a roughly the same cost as the initial audit. And then we'll be continuing, continuing to do that on, a, on an annual basis until the recertification audit, audit in uh, 2024. Um, okay, so I can talk, talk that, that's effectively our, our, our certification journey. Um, so I'll, I'll talk. Um, more broadly about um, what ISO 27001 is. Um, so it, it's, a, it's an information security management system, um, both a framework and a certification. Um, it's not the only, only one available. Um, there, are, there are many globally. Um, it is by far the most um, preeminent, um, particularly outside of America. There's, there's a bit, a few others in America. Um, SOC2 or SOC2 comes up a bit. Um, that's a much more expensive exercise and that's more financially driven uh, by the, uh, I think that's a certified practicing accountants organization. Um, in the UK, the, there's the ISMA Cyber Essentials. Um, again, um, fairly similar ISO 27001, a little bit simpler, um, more technical focused um, and also reasonably expensive. Um, there's also um, free frameworks. Um, now these don't have, a, there's no certification body associated with these, um, but they do actually provide uh, a good system that you can implement. Um, there's a NIST, the American NIST system, which is yeah, probably world leading. Um, Australia actually has, I, I think, a, a remarkably good um, cybersecurity capacity at a government level. Um, the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, the ACSC, provides a lot of good information for free. Um, they provide essential aid, which is really for smaller organisations to do the basics, and, and then a very detailed information security manual 
um, that they actually map back twice, so 27,001. So we, we do touch that as well. Um, NIST also published some other, other, frame, uh, other more detailed specifications as well, which are also free. Um, okay, so broad, broadly speaking, um, what, what is ISO 27001? Um, it, it's, it, it's best to think of it in the same framework as 9001 and 14001, um, in the same way that um, they're designed to implement, integrate quality and health and safety, um, sorry, environment, um, sorry, you know, the environment into the um, organizational processes. Um, it, ISO 20001 is designed to make sure information security is built into the organizational processes. Um, and in that light, they are um, the, these different management systems, um, effectively meta standards, uh, standards on how to build your own standards, um, uh, all, all share a similar um, high level structure. Um, so there's a lot of overlap in the documentation. We, we could reuse um, significant parts of our QMS um, to deliver um, uh, our information security management system. Um, the analogy I use from my from my IT 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 perspective, um, look, looking looking at it um, at, at management from the outside, um, it's really uh, um, top level management making a binding commitment um, to prioritise information security. Um, I, I use the um, the term, yeah, you know, can God make a stone too heavy for him to lift? In this case, yes, <laughs> that, that's what management's doing. They're they're making a commitment that they won't circumvent these for expediency. Um, and on the on the framework side of things, um, there is actually quite a lot of detail in 27001 on actually what technical controls are required. Um, it provides um, the 114 controls in total. Um, many of them are administrative and in, in within 9001, um, in overlap with nine, ISO 9001. So they're, they're the same, they're, they're called administrative controls within the information security um, terminology, but they're, they're the same controls you'd recognize in any other management system. Um, but there are also many technical controls, and some of these are uh, informative and recommendations. Um, others are, are normative and, and required, and that, that and that's actually what led to our non-conformances on our initial audit. It's, we had actually assessed those controls. We deemed that the risk was acceptable, and we're willing to to tolerate that. Um, they said no, <laughs> you, you can't accept away that risk. You must have that that um, that infrastructure in place. Um, that, that was simply a UPS. Um, in our case, our, our power supply is very high quality. Um, arguably, it's not necessary, but it was a, um, a normative requirement of the, of the standard. Um, so yeah, this is a, a list of, of what you may not have. Um, so even if you have good cybersecurity, you, you may not have um, these, these documents. Um, Craig, and, sorry, yeah. and one of the things I think it's important to have a, a sort of discussion on is that some of this stuff you would be already doing and we were doing, but we just hadn't documented how we're doing it, right? We, we Fundamentally, we were doing all these, um, you know, management of it, but we didn't have a formal document and a process around it. So sometimes it's about actually formalizing a process you're already running, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's sometimes you might need a lot of information, but realistically, you're already doing it if you're running a business of some sort, right? Yeah, precisely, yeah. Um, so really, as as the teacher saying, you you would have you would have, if you're running you're running your business, um, you know, um, if, if the business is running well, it's it, you you will have these documents in, in some capacity, um, but they do have to be made explicit and they do have to be referenced when when you're audited. There, there'll be a clause, um, and you simply point to the document that you've got um, that 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 ticks that box, um, and um, I mean I can just run through them very very quickly um, without without repeating the standard. You, you, Obviously, you need the policy that's uh, identical to the QMS policy. It, it provides the mandate um, for the um, um, for the organisation to or, or, or members of the organisation to implement information security. You have the standards that the, the um, policy references to actually implement it, um, and then there's the I guess the information, the IT specific stuff, which is yeah, you need an asset register, um, you need a risk register risk treatment plans, um, a DRP, disaster recovery plan, uh, what, what happens when your system goes down. Um, all, all things companies either uh, written down formally or just informal knowledge within the organisation, everybody will have this. Um, but ha having said that, a, a, a good IT service management system um, is a significant investment, um, and but that will make your life a lot easier. Um, so ITIL is, is one of the, the leading IT um, uh, service management system frameworks. Um, we simply 
implemented um, actually a free um, a free one uh, open source um, a little bit of labor to set up but um, it works very well and, and again ticks all our bosses boxes um, there is actually an annex a in ISO 27001 that that lists out all 114 controls um, and that's that's perfect um, if you want to know whether you comply with it just go through that list and and, and tick the boxes and we were able to do that more or less from the get-go Okay, um, here I'll basically give a bit of a, an, a um, I guess, a description of, of information security. Um, so this is not really to do with, directly to do with ISO 27001 um, or even information security management system, but I thought this might be helpful um, in actually providing more of an academic um, description of the theory behind information security. Um, so in, the intent of this is, is simply to break away from the mindset of this being an IT problem. Um, IT is very good at, um, at implementing, at, at blocking problems as they occur, um, but it doesn't scale to, to an organization. Um, it, IT is bottom up. Um, a, a good, good organizational information security must be top down. It must have organizational support. Um, every time you implement a good, um, good control, there is an organizational cost to it. it if it's well managed, it, it's very minor and it's certainly well worth the price, um, but you, there has to be the commitment that for instance, um, if your processes require um, approval to access a resource and the approver of that is, is unavailable, then the business has to know that they will have to wait. Um, if there's a technical problem with, with something, um, then the solution is not simply to turn it off and bypass it. Um, you fix the problem, you devote the resources to fixing it. Um, it's, it's very easy to turn off a security system because it's causing problems um, and, um, and then I have seen it happen. It, 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 does, it, does, it doesn't get prioritized to be turned back on. There's a vulnerability that you didn't, didn't exist. Um, so yeah, I'll just um, give a very brief, um, just sort of theoretical description. Um, we always think about um, from an IT perspective or from an organizational perspective, information security, it's always um, these, these are your six assets, six asset classes, and you need to consider all of them. Uh, none of these can be ignored. Um, there's the IT stuff, which everybody knows about, everybody thinks about in IT, there's the hardware, the software, the network, um, but also, also the people. Um, and, I, and I'm not being, you know, this is not in a negative sense either. Um, there is the IT security cliche is, you know, people are the weakest link. No, that, that's, that's, not, that's not true. People also are the strongest link. It's people are an integral part of the process and the system has to take that into account. You'd empower them to be the, one of the barriers, right? Precisely, yes. Um, and the processes, um, the, the workflows that we, um, uh, that, that all these um, systems have to work together to implement, um, that you know, define, define the organizational operations and um, the information. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, that's really what, that's what's being protected more than anything. Um, everything else exists to support the, um, the storage and the processing and the, and the um, improvement of the information um, that, you, you, that you're um, using. And um, <laughs> I'll move, move to the, um, the, the CIA here. Um, now, this is not the three-letter ag agency, um, so there's a bit of, bit of confusion there sometimes, but um, this comes up over and over again in information security, um, and it really has to be part of the mindset, mindset is um, all of these assets we, we describe, they all have vulnerabilities, um, and those vulnerabilities can always be um, looked, viewed at through the lens of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, and those, those words don't need don't need further description. Um, achieving one or two of these is, is easy. Um, it's easy to have complete confidentiality, convention, con sorry, confidentiality and integrity by locking everything in a vault. Um, it won't be available. It's not useful. Equally, you can publish all your information on the internet. It'll be perfectly available. Uh, there'll be no confidentiality or integrity. Um, actually, maintaining all three um, is, is the challenge, and that's that's why these these systems exist. To achieve that, um, and, and these are the um, these are the threats. Um, so this is what this is what these what ex, um, exploit the vulnerabilities. Um, and I, th these are my terms, but this, this is why I consider it. There's there's the insiders. Um, I use the term parasites. Um, these are the people who um, who um, work for the organisation, might help themselves to the data, might describe to scrape some, um, take it with them. Um, yeah, that, that's obviously completely unacceptable, both to um, the organization and also to our stakeholders, our clients won't talk about that either. 
Um, so we certainly have to protect against that. Um, there's the outsiders, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and I, I term these the predators. And and these 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 um, organisations operate at different levels of maturity. Um, at the state level, actors, if they target an organisation, it's very challenging. Um, but equally, um, any, any attack requires resources, so it's always a cost benefit for them. Um, and that that's the thing. Uh, predators, these um, outside attackers, are not necessarily lone wolves. They are often very efficient um, organizations um, and um, yeah, very, very effective at what they do. And it's a business form, that, that's all it is. Um, there's classic examples, I'll, I'll throw in a few which are, uh, are notable. Um, the Colonial Pipeline um, a ransomware attack by Darkside. Um, I mean, $4.4 million ransom paid. Apparently they actually got most of that back, um, but the economic damage of shutting down um, the systems was um, huge. Interesting enough, that was actually an attack on the IT system. So the, the actual pipeline and the and the and the um, oil and gas uh, transport wasn't wasn't affected. Um, it was simply um, they couldn't charge for it. So um, they um, yeah they 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 shut the OT the operational systems down as well. Um, less widely known, the ANU was um, compromised quite thoroughly in 2018. Um, suspected to be by China, um, and they. There's no ransomware. They were very quietly um, uh, acquiring uh, confidential data on, on students and student activities. Um, and again, anybody who's been um, ransomware, um, I know many people have. Um, yeah, I, I think we all do. So probably, um, unless the teacher wants to add anything there. Um, that's, yeah, I um, mean, we've, we've sort of talked about it internally because I've had a ransomware happen to me and that was just, uh, and I'm pretty, uh, you know, cyber savvy about it, but it was just in a, you know, a moment of haste. I just didn't think about it and just pressed OK. And everything looked OK, right? You know, even the one that we looked at recently, they've created a, a, a front end, which is Australia Post, and you never think about it, but it's just that lapse in judgment or the lapse in concentration. That's what they're expecting you. And then basically everything in my hard drive or my computer got... Uh, you know, locked for ransomware. So we're all part of the problem at some point in time. And, and truthfully, although the, the law enforcement say don't pay the ransom, um, most people do. And most people get the money, get, get their data back. Yeah. Like they, they, they do actually provide very good after sales service. <laughs> service. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and I guess that's what, that's what keeps their business working. Um, and also accidental, um, the accidental threats, um, Facebook, um, just very recently had a five hour global outage. Um, I, they lost an extraordinary amount of um, lost revenue um, and the, the company value was significantly dropped. And that wasn't a malicious attack, that was simply a configuration error. Um, and apparently they locked themselves out of their own recovery systems as well. So um, yeah, it was, um, I'm sure a very intense five hours for a lot of people at Facebook. And I'll talk about just quickly environmental threats. Um, these are, do, you do have to consider these. Um, I mean, the obvious one, fire, um, water. Um, and this, this actually, I, I know of two separate incidents, in, incidents uh, related to water. Um, there's a company that I used to work for that has an office in Brisbane um, that actually was almost affected by the South Bank floods in 2011. Um, certainly the, the equipment was had to be relocated ahead of that very rapidly. Um, and yeah. Farms get hit by lightning all the time. Um, a family member of mine had their entire electronics uh, suite annihilated by um, uh, a nearby lightning strike. But even for us in the office, we had a pipe leak literally sure. about two meters, three meters away from our server room. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, you couldn't have predicted that. No, no. Um, incompetence on the part of the tradesmen working in the cooling water loop in the, in the plenum space. <laughs> yeah correct nothing we can do i mean and, and at least i mean don't leave equipment on the floor <laughs> we, again we were lucky because everything had been elevated just out of common sense but um we certainly didn't expect expect that um and i guess the, the interaction of these um threats and vulnerabilities um is is a simple traditional risk um, and this is obviously identical to that used anywhere else in engineering there's a probability of it occurring happening there's a a consequence and you calculate the risk. Um, so we actually reuse the existing risk, risk matrix that um, Niha had developed for other, other business risks. Um, and I think ours is fully quantifiable, I'd say, yeah. um, the risks. Um, so we're actually lucky enough to attach a dollar value to, to every, every risk. 
Um, and um, okay, so it, the big part of what I say twenty seven thousand one provides is a, as a list of controls, um, and and these are both at the administrative level, um, the high level, um, which is really identical to the you know the QMS style controls, um, and then there's the the lower level administrative controls, um, you know, simply ensuring information is correctly classified, um, that people are trained, um, that the workflows for IT uh, adequately. Um, um, uh, workflows the organisation that involve information uh, are adequate. Um, and yeah, all of these controls uh, basically either act to um, reduce the chance of the, the um, of an incident happening or to ameliorate, uh, reduce the, the consequences of, of a successful event or from our viewpoint, an unsuccessful um, event. Um, and you can't ignore, I guess, um, the phys physical side as well. That is, that is an important part of it. Um, certainly the auditors focus very heavily on that um are the doors locked um uh, is the building secure the fire suppression system available very basic stuff but um it is something they they do focus on um and then there's and i, I am moving over very quickly is is the technical side of things obviously you can't underestimate how important that is um and that's something samira can can talk about a little bit later um is the, this this really does require specialist technical expertise. This is um, no different to a, a, any other engineering problem. Um, you, you have to you have to have um, expertise. In this. Yes, yes, an SME for that, which is in our case is, is Samira. Um, and um, the controls work using the same sort of Swiss cheese model. Um, there's multiple barriers, um, and usually in an in an event. Um, um, stays an event because um, one of the barriers works to, to either prevent it or to eliminate any consequence. Um, occasionally these get through and then they unfortunately label incidents. So really that, that's the, the whirlwind introduction to in information security. Um, now I said earlier that the technical controls um, are um, uh, probably a, a subject in its own right and it's probably even a little bit dangerous to talk about them um, without um, you know, spending a lot more time and energy on it. Um, I will say these um, are really just effectively common sense, but surprisingly uncommon. Um, never reuse a password. Um, and that, that's actually, I've heard people say, what, never? It's like, no. In, I mean, there are very occasional exceptions, but ideally every system you touch should be unique, have a unique password. Um, Obviously, it's utterly impossible to remember, um, you know, hundreds of passwords, unique passwords. Um, that's why it's absolutely critical. You have to use a password manager um, and trust it. Don't, don't try and protect yourself from the password manager. Um, trust it. Trust it with all of your passwords. Choose that very carefully and protect um, the password to the password manager very, very carefully. That has to be a very long, very unique password. Um, in terms of just password, um, uh, techniques. Um, it, password itself is probably a misnomer. Um, it should be past phrases now. Multiple words um, concatenated together will provide a very strong password. Um, you, you generally protect against brute forcing. Um, an eight character password will be can be just guessed um, just simply by iterating through every combination quite quickly. Um, Multi-factor authentication is fantastic. Um, use it wherever you can. Um, the fact that almost everybody carries a smartphone with which itself has good good um, uh, security um, provides a means of um, really proving your identity and and dis disproving it for anybody else um, who's trying to access your system. Patch your software to the latest version. Um, almost every time you hear about a um, an actual technical breach, not a not not authentic not a authentication or identity being compromised, but actual a, a traditional hack, it's because people didn't update their systems and it was an old old software that had a, an old bug in it that was probably fixed by the vendor years ago, but um, that system's still live somewhere. Um, and then the obvious stuff, um, whenever you walk away from a computer, um, if you're using Windows one, always press WinL. Um, you, you almost never see an IT guy uh, walk away from a computer without pressing WinL. Win um, yeah, it's just it just means you can absolutely certain nobody is gonna access your files while you're not there. Um, USB drives, never use them unencrypted. Um, BitLocker is great. I mean, it does lock you to a, to a Windows environment, um, but uh, that's, that's in my opinion, uh, an unavoidable uh, price of using USB. Um, and the other thing is, um, if you're opening any network services to the internet, um, 
use a modern VPN. Um, don't expose any services. Um, the exception to that is is if you are actually publishing applications, um, as as we are we are starting to do, um, and we we're very lucky. <clears throat> excuse me that we're developing quite a strong suite of um, uh, firewalls, web application firewalls to protect that. But again, that requires um, significant subject matter expertise. Um, I, I do know of smaller companies and, and even people who have exposed network services um, or posed, exposed their NAS or exposed remote desktoping without a VPN or with a, an ancient VPN. And yes, eventually they get hacked. It's just, uh, it's, it's almost a computational exercise for for attackers. Um, so yeah, um, this is really what I, I wanted to cover in yep. the information security side. Um, if there's any questions, we can sort of pause mm. here or we can just, uh, while Samira gets ready and then Samira can take over from there, yeah? Mm. Uh, questions could be posed at the end of the lecture. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, Samira is saying he's, Samira is saying the mic and camera disabled by host. Uh, can you uh, get Samira online? Sorry. Uh, the host Jamila. Is... Hello, Jamila. Jamila. Yeah, Mr. Nisa. Yeah. Uh, can we get Samira online? Uh, Samira is connected, but it looks like his microphone and camera are uh, disabled. It's just disabled because of the presentation. That's all. Okay. Can you can you um, can you enable his? Yeah, I, I already yeah. did. Yeah. Okay. Um, here we are. Can you hear now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Samira, are you taking control of this? Uh... Uh, sure, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, I had a bit of uh, technical issues uh, because uh, one of my, uh, <laughs> it's one of the security control, it's been triggered in malfunction. <laughs> so it shut <laughs> down. Security is working then, Samira. <laughs> uh, it's uh, shut down basically my camera and the audio. So that's fine, yeah. Uh, uh, excuse me, Samir and Matisha, we have yeah. uh, all together 20 minutes more. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to introduce myself as an ICT security analyst and uh, at working at NIHA for the last two years. And my core responsibility is looking after NIHA uh, security posture, posture, including the uh, network infrastructure and the servers and the other applications, and also providing uh, ISO 27000 security uh, compliance guidelines and uh, uh, the procedures for the end users to make sure they are following there at the uh, uh, at all the times. So my topic is to uh, I think uh, uh, I was just about to talk about the VPNs and the firewalls and but I don't think uh, that I have that much of time. So I'll take over to the uh, topic. Uh, why is the cybersecurity important for smart homes? So does anybody uh, using a smart homes concept in uh, in uh, here or? Oh, okay. Can you give me any like uh, sort of experience that you've been uh, gone through? Uh, does anybody victim of uh, being hacked, like a security uh, appliance at your home? Nobody. <laughs> Maybe Samira. Everybody is and doesn't want to admit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, the, the, almost every person uh, today use the IoT device like uh, Google Home, smart locks and smart cameras. Uh, these device comes as, as a, like a single board uh, computers where it has a much more capabilities to uh, uh, ease your day-to-day -day activities. For instance, most of the air conditions and the, uh, the refrigerators uh, today have their own smart application where you can install in your a smartphone and control over your voice. So you can control the temperature of these devices, turn on them and basically uh, and easily uh, co control all the functions. Uh, it doesn't matter where you stay. So moreover, so if you talk about the smart home device like uh, the Google Nest and the Amazon Echo, you might have heard about those things, uh, uh, make it even more convenient to control the IoT applications uh, uh, smartly. Um, 
and these uh, the but what I felt was is uh, going through the most of the surveys and all. And um, what do you think, Matisha? Would you take like the convenience over security or not? Well, because I've been hacked so many times, I'll take the security. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, is most of the most of the people what they do, uh, they think is like uh, you may have heard the saying that the convenience and the security don't always go hand in hand. Like uh, this is certainly true for smart homes because uh, these devices and appliances are extremely convenient for the end user, but also they, those are comes in the in the most of the well-known vulnerabilities. And also, let imagine that, uh, for instance, uh, the um, smart uh, CCTV camera installed in your home uh, get control of your all other uh, appliances at your home. And also, the data can also get hacked if any of, you, any of your smart home device get hacked. For instance, smart home can, system can often be hacked when you uh, when you come from and leave the user's data for a smart features like uh, turning on the AC when you are coming into the home and uh, turn off the light. Those are the those are the very uh, critical data they need. And also, <clears throat> when it's come to the uh, uh, when it's come to the vulnerability of uh, smart appliances. Uh, we need to first talk about the uh, your home routers because uh, the router is the weakest link at your home. Why I'm saying like that is uh, we had an incident in uh, back in 2017 because uh, this is like a sort of a government sponsored uh, project where it happens in the USA. The CIA basically they have inject uh, the uh, spyware called uh, blue jeans into the uh, most of the house owners to track down their internet behaviors. So so. This, this, uh, the point is we need, they need to come in a sort of a standard. They need to implement, implement the security standard uh, for the end, user, end users to provide the better security in terms of uh, uh, using a, a smart home appliance at your uh, home. The, aside from the wonderful uh, smart appliances, uh, the, aside from the routers, each connected IoT enable are also risks when it's come to the uh, uh, hacking. The hackers use the platforms such as uh, Sodan engines and the Mirai. Like uh, those, those are the technical uh, the platform uh, we use in the real industry for for us to scan the uh, uh, routers or the switches, the firmware, whether they have a, uh, well known vulnerabilities or not. So the IoT standard the 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 because due to this reason. The standard must be set because most of the uh, Internet of Things IoT devices still we don't have a proper standard in terms of security because uh, most of the expert Internet of Things have encouraged uh, a lot of associations, group Internet providers, and uh, most of the companies, uh, manufacturers, they come together to define the security standard uh, for the upcoming IoT shift. I think this is uh, this may going to happen within the next two, three years, but I don't know. The security standard uh, basing uh, the base on the smart, uh, like uh, it should be based on the smart authentication and also the network frequency, the firmware update, the consumer guarantee, and also the end user should be able to have the like uh, technical support from the product. So the the because the the focus on the threat are scaling up to the uh, IoT vulnerabilities compared to the security measures in place. Well, the reason is the security for IoT. Um, smart homes currently uh, restricted by uh, the manufacturer uh, settings and the network providers. The reason is uh, because these, uh, this setting is the collective of IoT in, uh, security industry standard born from uh, collaboration uh, of network engineers. Pardon me, Samira. Can I interrupt? Yeah. Somebody is asking what is IoT? Uh, Internet of Things. Internet, Internet of? Things. 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 Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. It's, it's basically any device that connects onto the internet, right? Okay. That's correct, so yes. From smartphones to devices, to your Apple Watch, to your computer, everything that connected, connects to the internet in whichever shape or form is an yeah. IoT device. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, that concept is uh, uh, really uh, well famous in, uh, in, a, in a Europe or back in here in Australia or maybe in the US uh, because nowadays we we very, we because everything uh, connected to the same uh, central hub where we don't we, we don't have to uh, buy uh, certain things to uh, to segregate the services so basically um, 
the that's the main advantage of, of having a iot uh, and the, or basically uh, basically the concept of uh, smart homes at your home so uh, by saying that the the we need to be also aware of the how this uh, this uh, threat awareness of uh, for smart home owners how it's going to work the the first uh, concept is to the the smart home is to uh, the automation process of the efficiency the when homeowners decide to adapt to the concept for smart homes, they must also be uh, aware of threat uh, confronting of the smart home cyber criminals uh, that are uh, like uh, trolling internet and they are devising hacks aimed at the smart homes. Why, why, why we are saying is that in, in response, uh, we, we would be, we might be smart home. Sorry, someone asked something? No. Okay, uh, the the security for smart homes can start with the awareness and the taking the necessary steps to secure the integrity of your home uh, network. Uh, because of the, for this procedure, you need to make sure you need to follow the certain things. Make sure that your home router software is always up to date. So, how are you going to select the best product? This is uh, really uh, difficult to comprehend the uh, the situation and how to decide uh, which, which product that I want to buy the based on the you are you are uh, based on your situation so especially so so for, before you buy any routers before you buy any home browser you need to make sure that you need to go through their reviews and the recommendation especially you should have a, a technical assistant from their end and the patches and software update issues by the router manufacturers containing important uh, security fixtures as soon as they compromise or any vulnerabilities Released to the uh, CEV, uh, we, uh, there, there's a database uh, we known as like uh, common vulnerability exposure. That is that is the place where if something has happened, we release uh, like a unique signature into the database to uh, to keep the record in uh, uh, for the future analysis. The the second one is the make sure that you have home network firewall installed because uh, normal uh, the the general routers comes with the inbuilt firewall. But it, it is not like it is not like a stateful firewall where it doesn't have like a certain rules to defend any malicious activities, and the, so that means it's going to break your first line defense against a network intrusion. So you need to make sure when you are buying, you, you need to have an inbuilt stateful firewall these days because uh, maybe 15 or 20 years back it doesn't matter. We we, we can go ahead with the basic router. And the third one is uh, like uh, like your router software. It's connect device uh, device such as appliances and the system must also have the latest system software installed. Like if you if you're using any IoT devices, you need to make sure your firmware and the uh, firmware upgrades and the the device is up to date. <coughs> Manufacturer of the smart devices also issue a security fix fixes in the uh, smart update and. Um, if you are not sure what what need to what need to be uh, need to be concerned on uh, what should you do, you you can hire like a sort of a, a network security consultant uh, while listing in a, a smart home security professional assess your vulnerability of your home before you set up uh, before you go into the totally move into the IoT setup. It's like a mesh, like uh, if one point compromise, so you're gonna lose and every each and everything. So you need to make sure. To follow all these procedures before you are looking into the, uh, uh, the smart appliances uh, at your home. Then, Amira, the, there's yes. another question. Yeah. Sarin Randula asks the, the question Is yes. IoT device security considered in ISO 27001 and ISO 27, uh, 27017? uh yes if if because in this industry point of view there are limited number of iot devices has been released where you can use for the uh, business purposes so these the the devices what i'm talking right here is like where you can use for the your your at your home but when it's come to the in, industry level so yes, we have a security standard to be followed before you buying any devices. Thank Does you. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, the last point is, uh, and I, I and I just need to go through the uh, 
whenever you are having a router like it's a default by default it comes with the uh, the security uh, uh, type called WEP we known as like uh, uh, that is that is uh, I think it's a very old protocol is stand in vulnerable uh, it is it is already being compromised but the uh, most of the default routers comes with the WEP so you need to make sure you to use WPA2 PSK keys like a private shared key comes with the advanced encryption uh, standard. The WPA stand yeah. for Wi-Fi protection access. And each and every routers, before you uh, release any traffic into the uh, outside, you need to make, first thing you need to make sure is to change your security key and the standard. And also you need to make sure you need to change the SSID uh, just don't leave it as a default name in there because it is very easy for us to or any if, if any person doing like the ethical hacking or the, or doing in another way it's very for, easy for us to uh, get into your network and uh, uh, do a lot of harm things and the final thing is i want to uh, emphasize is the network security advancement uh, that is the concept of uh, uh, based on the ai artificial intelligence the uh, the, the reason is uh, the, IO, uh, the, the vulnerability that, that comes with the IoT concept, that is a practical application that uh, um, start with the smart home automation. So the new technologies like uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, you may have heard about the machine learning, are being uh, like uh, geared for the uh, field testing for the combat of, for, the, for the cyber threats. Basically, this concept comes with the modern um, home appliance with the firmware. If anything's like, uh, if, any, uh, if, if the appliance is pending on any updates or whether it has a well-known uh, vulnerabilities or whether it need to fix any firmware uh, loopholes. So what it happens is it automatically trigger these the certain functionalities itself and the user may even um, don't have to authorize uh, to update the um, appliance so it, it it does automatically everything so you just you don't have to do anything if anything is serious of uh, event what it happens is like uh, it can send you an alert okay you need to take in certain action to fix this issue so if you are planning to get start with the home automation i would rather advise to awareness of security and risk must be a part of your planning that means uh, you need to assess your risk before you implement anything at your home and choosing a smart home uh, and uh, maybe the energy management system or choose a, uh, like a company that has a great uh, track of records providing product support and also the technical support and the consultant update on, on your devices firmware. In addition to uh, that, uh, uh, safe, and, uh, safe and reliability of the network we use, uh, there are plenty of uh, other reasons that uh, we can uh, go ahead with uh, before you uh, step into the smart home, home concept. And, um, um, and also uh, when we talk about the standard, the, the, we, don't, we don't have, still, still we don't have the proper standard for the most of the 99% of the IoT devices. Because this is uh, this the, the lack of security standard being issues uh, the since IoT device become a popular on on a two years or three years ago maybe so the reason is still that there are certain organizations like a Cloud Security and IEEE and also the um, the um, Open Web Application Security they are constantly working on on to come into the uh, standard. But still, uh, we haven't heard anything of uh, that, that they, they have come to the conclusion and they can release the final version of the IoT standard. Thanks, sir. I think that we're running out of time. Um, yeah. I think that uh, one of the things just wanted to sort of iterate is that why we sort of picked uh, smart homes and try to apply sort of these um, sort of information modules was to sort of be more relatable if we try to put it into our business context. It just wouldn't have made sense to anybody. So that's why we tried to sort of make it a bit more logical to everybody who would literally have a house and want to go smartphones or smart devices or smart houses in the future. So that's, I think, the conclusion of our presentation. Yes, and yeah. uh, we're happy to take any questions. Uh, I guess these guys probably more so than me. I can't really answer most of this stuff. Okay.
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Samir, uh, Craig, and uh, Matisha. There yeah. are a couple of questions. Uh, I'll read the question. This is from Niranga. Uh, the question is, for an event to be security incident, does it need to be, does it need to penetrate the protection layers? Number two, can't a network probe cannot be a security incident if you think it's worth reporting? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll respond to that. Um, yes, it does does have to, to to penetrate the barriers to be to be escalated from an event to an incident. Um, that, that's a matter of definition as much as anything. Um, having said that, we recently suffered uh, a, a very serious event um, that was capped caught at the last barrier. Um, I actually elected to report that um, because it did include bank account details owned by the, the threat um, and reported that to the police. But in our systems, that, that remained an event. It, it's a matter of definition. The fact that something is only an event um, doesn't necessarily mean you ignore it. Um, yeah. it it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for learning and strengthening your, your controls further. Um, a serious event would have got through most of your barriers. Um, the fact that I was caught by one doesn't mean that the other barriers didn't fail um, and they can always do with tightening. And I think, Thank the, you, Greg. The, and the thing is the learnings from each event mm. provides the overall barrier management because it's a continuous True. improvement process, right? You can't just assume that your system's good because people are coming up with new ways to hack your system anyway, so. Absolutely, yeah. And again, that, that, that leads into sort of the higher level of the, of the certification of um, not even of an information security management system is that there's that constant plan, do, check, act cycle um, that exists really beyond the IT security or even information security. It's about constantly improving the business to, to ensure uh, information security is continually improved. Thanks, Greg. Uh, this is from Senaka. The question is, what would be the expected gain for cyber attackers by attacking a home through the through smart home network? Um, yeah, um, yeah. So basically, if anybody compromise your smart uh, uh, CCTV system at your uh, home, so what happened is we can track down uh, the uh, your da daily activities and which time you are going out of the home, which time you are coming into the home. Also in uh, smart appliances like, uh, like a fridge, so we basically uh, can control the uh, temperature of the uh, appliance. Also, if you leave or um, if you leave your computer open, or if you have a, like a certain like a classified document. So what I can do is I can have a copy and I can uh, have a I can delete everything, wipe up from from your device, and later on I can uh, blackmail you and demanding uh, uh, maybe the uh, bitcoins or maybe the money or something like that. So that is what's going to happen um, for most of the cases. Can I, can I just throw in there, um, this is not personal experience, but I, it's something I read that um, uh, I think a, a baby cam was compromised, or a web connected baby cam. Um, somebody had reused a password. Um, the actual baby cam system remained secure, but um, somebody had reused a password from a system that was compromised. And um, basically somebody else was watching their child and, and speaking to it actually through the indoor my speaker. Right. Thanks, Amira. Next yeah. question. This is from uh, our Queensland president, uh, Jayanta Vikramatunga. How far Australian legal system is advanced to punish cyber criminals? Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's actually it's a good question. Like in cyber crimes, I think in uh, Australia, we have a act, act, act called state of uh, federal uh, legislation. Uh, uh, I think it's a criminal code act 1995, as I remember. So, so this is how it works. So if anything has happened, it's go to the forensics. So based on the digital, digital evidence, uh, I'm not sure in uh, the, the law in Australia, because I never had, I have never gone through like a, such experience uh, until now. Um, maybe Craig, uh, have you heard any, any incident? Truthfully, I, it's really not relevant. <laughs> um, almost all of the attackers are not in our jurisdiction. 
Um, so oh, I, right. um, we report a successful incident in, involving, you know, a, a ransom bitcoins. You report to, to law enforcement; they take a note of it. Uh, it's inevitably from Russia, China, North Korea, Ukraine, wherever. Um, there's absolutely no chance of legal redress. Um, the, the, the legal perspective from our viewpoint is, is illegal bearing consequences on us if we, if we lose data. Um, and I, I touched on it very briefly earlier, but um, certainly there's, there's discussion that the um, Australia is considered behind in legal, really legal persecution, I guess, of, uh, of companies that, that um, lose data. So that, that's, that's the legal <laughs> context. It's not, not so much to protect us, but to, um, to protect um, those whose data we, we, we hold on their behalf. Thank you. Um, yeah. Do you agree, Samira? Yeah, Samira, you can. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And also it is like basically in here, it is an offense uh, to cause any unauthorized access to data held in uh, your computer. So it is like, it is a crime basically. So um, yeah. Okay, next question, bit, bit long, from Arbit Like. Question is, we were recommended to use modern VPNs as a security measure, but recently we did see a hack on NordVPN. This put a dent on which VPN to trust, to trust uh, to begin with. As a consumer, what would be what would be the best thing to look for when we are trying to choose a VPN or a recommendation for a VPN service? End question. Uh, yes, the, uh, I heard about the NordVPN because the you need to select the which VPN you want the based on your situation, like whether it's a, a personal use or whether it's for your commercial use. So. There are a few different VPNs out in the market, like a SSL VPN and a side to side VPN and the client. And the based on the advanced en encryption mechanism, uh, I can go through the list, uh, but uh, it, it's a bit more technical, but I can explain in a briefly. Uh, like uh, the, the how the client work is in the based on the number of encryption keys going through the tunnel like uh, from A to B, if you have uh, like a communication, if you are trying to access your uh, corporate uh, resources from the out of the office. So we have a, like a certain uh, protocols to be followed before you, uh, before we implement the VPN uh, protocols. Like uh, for example, this is a well-known product call is uh, like uh, comes with the Cisco. Like uh, we have IQ version four and the uh, 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 tunnel to, um, uh, sorry, uh, la layer two tunnel protocols. So those are the two strongest VPN protocols right now used in the industry because uh, the Node VPN is uh, something like it's a, it is a it is it is a server but also it's uh, like a software based on where you can anybody can buy and install into your PC like likewise the other VPN where you need to set up actually inside your firewall along with the uh, VPN servers. Those are the two different things because NordVPN, um, uh, they, they also follow the same protocols, but they don't have uh, like uh, certain um, the uh, up-to-date uh, hardware appliances like a Cisco or any other uh, the firewall providers like uh, maybe uh, uh, the Fordman. Um, maybe you have heard about that. So, so uh, first we need to analyze the situation and we need to decide whether we will be able to, it also depends on your, how much classified data you have, how, how much uh, damage it might uh, happen uh, if someone compromises your system. Thank you, Samira. And uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, that's all about the uh, chat questions. And uh, can I ask Colombo, for Tamila to open the uh, uh, devices to um, the audience, if they have, if you have five ten minutes available, Tamila.
Yeah, it's allowed now. They can ask questions if they have. Right, they can ask questions now. Okay. Yes, sir, I'm uh, Jayant back again. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. I yes. think uh, speakers can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Th th thanks, Tisa. Thanks, Craig, uh, giving that uh, bit of explanation about the <clears throat> Australian legal system. If I'm explaining a little bit more, is there any like a global card of a system or understanding or any other association who are going to deal with these kind of uh, cyber criminals because it's never going to be end and then it's, it's a really a global crime being happening everywhere i'm just coming from whether is there any other global kind of uh, forum or any other sort of being developed to really tackle this uh, global issue uh, look, I mean, this is at a level of geopolitics that's way above my, um, yeah, really my yeah. understanding. Uh, um, I, I, I do know that, I mean, R Russia's attitude is, I think, quite openly um, that as long as the attackers don't target Russia, um, they don't care, um, basically. Um, and I, 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 I mean, just the way the geopolitical situation is moving in general, I don't think there's any expectation um, that um i mean the the, the russian uh, chinese um and I, I i i feel quite bad talking about it in such broad terms but that's that's as far as where the realistic um situation um i just don't see that changing um and it's in, certainly not in a way that will benefit a company like us um it's the responsibility is is on us um and i yeah um i'm, I'm not aware of any global moves um yeah in the, in the case of the but the colonial pipeline attack um i think <laughs> re reading some of the reports afterwards i think it put the fear of uh, of god into the to the dark side attackers when they realized how much harm they caused um because yeah i think <laughs> I, I think america was sufficiently angry that the russian government might have um you know brought the brought the hackers in I don't think that ever happened, but that's the closest to to actual I've seen of um, of um, attackers in another country being um, you know suffering suffering direct. Any other questions? Looks like that's about all. Uh, okay, then to wind up, and we are 10 minutes. This is Seneca here. Yes. Can I, can I ask? Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, just uh, continue. I mean, it's related, related to the colonial pipeline attack. And I was just wondering, I'm now this, and you have a lot of uh, technology and and a lot of developed uh, um, um, software and everything around this cyber attack and, and the prevention of these things. Why not it is still uh, trackable, the source of attack and how the ransom money was taken and then why can't you track down the source and the, and, and the origin of these attacks? Um, I'll talk about this, the, the, the ransom. Um, in, in that context, uh, Apparently, about three quarters of that was recovered. Um, I, I don't know the exact mechanism. Um, I know the ransom was paid in Bitcoin. That <laughs> for, for for just baked into the infrastructure of that. That's you know that that's the ransom um, currency of choice, um, and it is you know effectively untraceable. I, I'm not a I'm not into crypto, so I, I won't speak more about that. I, I don't I don't understand the mathematical details of why that's that's so difficult. Um, in terms of tracing the origins of the attack. Um, yeah, perhaps Mira can, can speak about the technical details of, of that. Um, yeah, uh, I, I will talk in generally because what happened is like uh, most of the attacks, we there are certain cases uh, we can do the reverse engineering and we, need, we might be able to find the source of attacks, but not 100% sure because uh, most of the attackers, what they do is they, they, they use like an anonymous uh, 
source of uh, internet or the places or the uh, the attacking uh, the what do you call the C2C servers like a, uh, that those are the servers they they run in the the source of uh, the source code of the attacks they are they are literally we cannot find the uh, location of those because in in what happened is in the cyber environment they have a uh, the environment called the uh, the dark dark web we known as a dark web because uh, where you sell you uh, all these uh, uh, the black uh, uh, where you sell you all the all the users privacy in there basically you, you do the the black money sell in there so that that is the place where they do like a like we are selling some items in the ebay we use the dark uh, web to uh, sell uh, certain uh, users privacy in there so we we don't have a, like a sort of a, still we don't have a sort of a mechanism to trace down and tackle their uh, them and uh, do the uh, take the certain action beforehand because uh, it is it is it, i would rather say it's like a 50 50 not 100 percent but there are certain cases we can do but there are uh, another 50 percent we cannot trace down at all yeah, I mean, there are, there are botnets um, around which are basically whole suites of compromised computers that are actually available for rent from the, from the right criminals. Um, you, you pay them money, they give you control of a whole bunch of compromised computers that could be anywhere in the world. Um, yeah, and from there, you, yeah, I'm just on a technical level, I guess you, it's not that challenging even conceptually to imagine the jumping from one computer to one computer to the other. Um, and even if you can trace... You know where the previous link in the chain is if there's 10 more computers in that chain um you'd have to actually diagnose or order each of those computers to work out where the traffic was originally coming from um it's very challenging exercise yeah it looks like it's extremely sophisticated and a very clever network of people this uh, doing these cyber attacks yeah yeah i mean I, I think that's the best way to think of them is i mean traditionally they're always sort of lone wolf hackers um I, I, as far as I mean, they don't, not like they publish themselves, but I mean, they're, they're organizations. They're organizations um, of very highly educated, very motivated um, young IT professionals. It just happens that their business model is compromising other, other, um, other organizations and um, extorting money out of them. It's mm -hmm. yeah. thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would, I would like to add something in there, like. Uh, most of the ransomware attacks happen because of uh, the end user uh, the weakness because there there is no any other way they 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 can inject the uh, the um, what do you call this uh, spy, spyware code into your machine because it, it cannot come through your backend or your from your network infrastructure or it it, it has to be an end user by clicking like uh, uh, the phishing email and download the code source code into your pc and uh, taking over the, all the control so, so basically, we need to have a, like a three layers of defense. If you break, if they can break the first layer of defense, okay, what sort of uh, solution we have in the second layer? If they break the second layer, so what sort of solution we have in the third layer? So we we have a, like a certain mechanism in place, uh, especially uh, uh, for example at uh, Niha. So if any, anything uh, intrusion attacks trigger from our backend, so then we'll cut off that host. Or if any user mistakenly click on the, any um, uh, the malicious link, so we still have a mechanism in place to cut off the full uh, uh, full lines of access for the intruder. Mm -hmm. Okay, gentlemen, I think time is up. Let me thank Niha organization and especially Matisha, Craig, and Samira for giving us this uh, beautiful, uh, very informative uh, uh, presentation. And uh, uh, I also uh, like to ask the presenters, could this uh, presentation uh, document be made available to IESLWA? Certainly, I'll send through the PowerPoint. Thank you very much. And uh, we will be in touch with you all. Uh, in the near future for the follow-up work. And uh, uh, I take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, the audience. Participation is around 55. And uh, thank, thank you all for your interest. If you have any questions to presenters, please 
uh, with their permission, I can uh, order uh, Western Australian uh, division of IESL can take this question and pass on to these speakers so that they can answer this question at their leisure time. Sure. If it is all right with you. Yep. Okay. And shall, um, I yeah. call this, shall I call this meeting over? Thank you very much for Colombo, especially Chamila, for helping us in this, uh, this uh, presentation. As always, you are most helpful. Thank you, Chamila. Uh, thank you. And thank uh, you. Yeah. Yes.